Well, the reason that uh, Oracle Red Bull Racing has chosen to partner with Bybit is quite simply is we want the best in class partner. And I A revolution of money has begun. The future is tradable. A couple weeks ago, Haas F1 announced they had now partnered with OpenSea, the world's largest NFT marketplace. Thinking this might be another Haas sponsor moment, I did a little research and I found that actually Haas aren't alone with their hands in the crypto money pot. Over the last few years, every single team and the sport itself has got involved with one of the world's newest and most controversial industries. Now, disclaimer, this is not necessarily bad. The technological theory on which cryptocurrencies are based is sound. It can be good to have openly accountable financial systems and currencies which are decentralized and not restricted by geographical borders. However, the reality is not quite the same as the theory, with the industry in its current state being massively centralized rife with scams and basically just a big funnel to pump loads of money into the pockets of a select few individuals. This video, therefore, is a reminder for fans of Formula 1 to be careful about what the teams are trying to sell them and to maybe, I don't know, not buy a hat with a company logo on the side if you don't know what the company does. We're going to take a journey through the digital Willy Wonka factory that is the world of crypto and find out how each F1 team is collecting money from the chocolate man himself. Do you want to buy and sell, nay, invest in digital collectibles, artworks, and exclusive utilities made possible only by... What do you mean, no? Just listen to the presentation, okay? NFTs are the future of owning things, rather than the days of buying real-world actual things which are heavy and you've got to put on a shelf. Ugh. You can now buy NFTs which are virtual, so they don't really exist at all, and they weigh nothing. Rather than paying fiat currency for artwork you can put in your house, you can now take that boring old money, transfer it into spicy digital money for a small transaction fee, and then use it to buy exclusive digital artworks and you can look at any time you want. Any time you want when you're logged into our website. You can hold on to these digital items for the sheer pleasure of owning them. Or trade them on at a later date and make a tidy little profit. Oh, um, actually... What is it? We can't say that NFTs are investment opportunities anymore. What? Well, basically, all prices have dropped for every single one this year, Like, so... like across the board? Like, every single NFT is worth less money now? Huh. NFT artworks are, perhaps, the most famous case of crypto innovations being, in fact, almost completely worthless, with the bubble around these assets bursting earlier this year. While the term NFT doesn't refer to the artwork, but rather the technology behind the artwork, which tracks who owns what, artworks are the most famous and most visible use case for them at the moment, and so therefore, NFT marketplaces are where we're going to start our tour. OpenSea, the world's largest NFT marketplace and sponsors of Haas F1, and Virtua, not the world's largest NFT marketplace, but also seemingly a brand spanking new <sighs> metaverse, oh god, sponsor of Williams. Now, if someone wants to create and sell digital artwork and someone else wants to go and buy that digital artwork, there should be a place for that to happen, right? I completely agree with that. So what's the issue here? Well, let's take OpenSea as an example. It's Straight up not a marketplace. It's an investment platform, it's just an investment platform. If I'm looking to buy some art, I would quite like to be able to easily search for different artworks, maybe learn a bit about the art, learn a bit about the artist, etc, etc. What's the information you get when you look at a collection on OpenSea? Market volume, floor price, circulating supply, how about some graphs on price activity, buy and sell order distributions? Like, guides, like, Honestly, this is quite clearly just an investment platform, but instead of stocks, you have digital furries. <sighs> oh good, he nods. That makes the three grand price tag worthwhile, clearly. Presenting information like this about NFT artworks, OpenSea, does kind of make it seem like you're saying they're an investment opportunity, 
OpenSea and not just trying to help me find some art that I like. Um, and that seems misguided at best and potentially fraudulent at worst considering they're almost certainly not. But okay, fine, let's say you as a buyer completely understand that you are not buying one of these as an investment, you are just buying it because you like it. Well, these sites are a good place to do that, right? Oh, right. Okay. Considering how fast OpenSea blew up, they kind of sort of didn't invest money quickly enough into some small little things, you know, like account security and fraud detection. In 2022, a phishing attack took place on OpenSea where almost $2 million at the time worth of NFTs were stolen from people's accounts. And then just a few months later, they had an eensy teensy little data breach and leaked 1.8 million emails. Right, okay, but assuming you weren't affected by this, at least everything you buy on here supports small independent artists, right? <sighs> Guys, come on. OpenSea allows people to mint and list NFTs for free. Cool, you can create an account with just a crypto wallet address and an email address, no other ID required. Cool, there is also no validation process to check the things that you upload are not stolen or spam. Um, doesn't that make it sound like it's very easy to just create a throwaway account and then steal loads of stuff and then upload it straight onto the site? Yes! In January of this year, OpenSea on Twitter disclosed that 20% of the NFTs created for free on its platform were plagiarized or spam. Oh no wait, sorry, no, I read that wrong. 20% weren't, 20%, 80% were. 80% of the NFTs created on the site for free were plagiarized or spam. 80%. But that's great news for you, the customer, because it now means you can buy public domain images. High quality photography. Oh, it's just a high quality image of the word photography. It's actually quite low resolution. An image of the word photography or just the logo for YouTube. Wow, what an investment opportunity. Sadly, it also seems that OpenSea does very little to remove any stolen artwork once it is identified to the platform. Maybe that's because, you know, there's so much of it. Um, it's a problem that is clearly known to the company because they, they tweeted about it, uh, but yet they continue to let it happen because in the world of crypto, regulation is a dirty word. So, rather than putting rules in place, which might anger maybe 10 Twitter accounts with NFT profile pictures, they go on instead just committing straight up crimes and malpractice. Nice! So, okay, NFT marketplaces overstate the value of NFTs a little bit, and they have been known to have poor security measures, but so do many websites. It seems really that the issue here lies with NFT creators. These are the people who are mostly duping people into thinking they are making something that's worth more than it is. At least the F1 teams aren't going out and creating their own NFTs. Every single team, and Pierre Gasly himself for some reason, has either got an NFT collection already out or has announced that there is one coming soon, probably in this winter break, I would imagine. Digital artworks for different race posters, driver helmets, cars, bits of car in the case of McLaren and Aston Martin, a video of Lance Stroll saying thank you for buying Aston Martin NFTs, which actually is hilariously meta, but I don't think that was intentional by Aston Martin. Now, on the face of it, it would just seem that these NFT collections are another case of companies selling overpriced stuff and hoping one or two people with more money than sense come along, buy a few pieces, and to an extent, they are that, yes. After all, these digital images really cost the company nothing to produce and they sell them for 50, 100, 1000 dollars. But if some rich guy gets a thing that he can brag to other rich dudes about and the company makes some money, there's a win-win, right? Well, if you start to look at these collections, you'll realize that lots of them have actually gone largely unsold. And then you'll realize to counter this, the teams have started to offer real world things to go along with the NFT, which starts to make you question, why don't they just, I don't know, sell the real world thing and have no crypto involved at all? Ah. So firstly, by selling stuff via an NFT, it's possible to disconnect the value of the thing you're selling with the price people actually have to pay for it. So you can end up selling someone, say, a signed Perez cap 
for $400 when actually they could just go online and get one for half as much. But that is not the real reason that all of these teams are now in the digital artwork frontier. No, no. The trick is, for most of these collections, you have to convert your standard currency into cryptocurrency, and that's where they get you now you're in the system. If some people are even just interested in potentially buying one of those things, they may go ahead and transfer some dollars or euros into Tezos or Phantom or Chili's or whatever. That is what these organizations are hoping for, because every time someone does that, there's fees on the way in and there's fees on the way out. And actually, the way out is not always that simple. And the whole thing gets even more wild if the NFTs are sold at auction. Lots of these auctions work on the stipulation that you already have to have the full amount you're willing to bid, plus a percentage on top of that, before you can even place a bid, let alone win the auction. Let's say you were trying to enter an auction to win a signed helmet by Yuki Sonoda. If a thousand people wanted to take part in this auction and all of them were willing to bid $100 worth of cryptocurrency, that's $100,000 that need to be converted into the currency just so the people can take part and one of them can actually pay for it. And lots of the time, where are you buying this cryptocurrency from? Is it from another user or is it, in fact, just from the person who made it in the first place? It's, it's option B lots of the time, funnily enough. The thing is as well, as soon as lots of people have bought into the system, the creator can just dip. They're gone, they made their cash, they've got dollars, the thing they wanted, they're gone. Abandon the project, done. You can trade crypto amongst yourself, you might make some money, <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> they've made theirs, they're done. The whole point of NFT collections from major brands is to get people through the door of these ecosystems. So yeah, maybe just don't buy these things. If you want to support a team, you can buy real world merchandise or I don't know, message the social media admin that you love them. On the topic of NFTs with added benefits added on top of them, there is one specific type I'd like to cover on its own. It's not necessarily sinister in any way, it's just a little bit strange. Socios, sponsors of Aston Martin and Alfa Romeo, create and sell fan tokens, crypto tokens associated with specific teams, mostly football, which advertise that they allow fans to influence the decisions of their team. Fan tokens give you the power to impact official decisions of your favorite team. And then Alpine has their own token in association with their sponsor, Binance. Oh wow, amazing. So if I have some of these tokens, I can join in on official team decisions, maybe driver signings for the future, development concepts to go down, liveries for the next season. Choose what logo is on the fan token. Oh right, that's slightly underwhelming. What music should we use in our next TikTok? I actually don't care, to be honest. Pictionary time. Choose a theme and Ocon will draw it. I paid money for this. To give Alpine some credit, there are some things on here which do actually seem like they give value to fans. Choosing an area of the factory for a behind the scenes tour, choosing a specific part of the car to get a talk about the intense development that went in for this new season. That stuff is actually kind of interesting, particularly for fans who are really into the technical side of the sport. But these are perks that could be offered for free on YouTube or in a sort of standard members club type dealio. You know the kind of thing, you sign up an email address, you pay like an annual fee. Why not one of those? Also, I'd like to add with the fan tokens, you can own more than one, but each one is one vote. And so rich people just get to vote more. And actually, if there were like actual team decisions, that's kind of not good because then one individual could just choose the entire. I mean, that's how the teams work anyway but it's not really democratic, is it? Anyway, so why the crypto? Well, as of any NFTs, the traceable proof of ownership is also a traceable proof of origin, which means any future sales of these tokens between different fans can always include a fee that goes back to the original creator. Imagine you bought some Pokemon cards and then you wanted to trade them for other Pokemon cards, but every time you made a trade, you had to give a dollar to Nintendo. It's like that. It's exactly like that. 2.5%, 5%, 7.5%, 10% in some cases of every sale down the line go back to the original creator. And you might say, oh, this is good. It supports small creators. It helps an artist make a living. Bro, these are multi-million dollar companies farming money from you. I will say as well, the whole thing does sort of sound like 
centralization to me. You know that thing that crypto people say is really bad? Well, it sounds like if everything is always tied to the original creator, it's kind of centralized. Hmm. So yeah, NFTs, overall, a few downsides. What's next on the tour? Ferrari is sponsored by Velas. Red Bull and McLaren are sponsored by Tezos. Alpha Tauri is sponsored by Phantom, and Alfa Romeo is sponsored by Floki. Now we're into the meat of the crypto industry. No vegetables, no sauce, just straight coins right into your veins. Now on the face of it, it's a little strange to be sponsored by a currency. I've never seen a team sponsored by Japanese yen before. It begs the question, if these new currencies are by the people, for the people, with no central authority that controls them, Who's doing the sponsoring? Oh, Mr. V, you don't understand. These are organizations, but they're not just a coin. They're the whole ecosystem behind it too. Velas and Tezos are blockchain infrastructures facilitating transactions, but also the development of revolutionary DeFi and D apps systems. And Phantom is a wallet provider giving unprecedented access into the world of personal finance, potentially eliminating world poverty as we know it. Uh-huh. Right, okay, so what you're saying is these currencies are made by small groups of people and not some infinite collection of everyone on the planet. Yes, and that these groups of people can decide how these currencies work and also how they're used. Yes, and do you agree that it's possible that these creators can give themselves enormous quantities of these currencies which they could sell down the line for a massive profit? Yes, and then they could just stop developing the project, making the whole thing completely redundant and potentially worthless after they've made their money. And actually, if they did do that and just left, there would be no one to hold them accountable because there is no central authority holding them to any kind of regulations. Yeah. And studies have shown that the number of these projects that survive long term may be less than 10% and that the average lifespan for a crypto project is 1.22 years. Yeah? Huh. I'm fine with people making new stuff. I'm also fine with people making new stuff and then asking other people if they want to buy into it, if they're transparent with the current state of the project and are held accountable to actually finish it, looking at you early access gaming. I am not fine with people making new stuff and then claiming it as a revolutionary finished product and then selling it before it actually does anything. That is not okay. By putting these cryptocurrencies on the side of F1 cars, the F1 teams are at the very least indirectly saying that they think these currencies are okay to buy. The teams give the fans confidence. And actually, as these things are sold primarily as investments, the teams are indirectly saying that they're good investments. But that may not entirely be true. Formula Netflix posted the report on Twitter a couple of weeks ago comparing the prices of all of these sponsorship coins at the time the sponsorship was announced to today or two weeks ago. But November 2022. A Ferrari fan who invested in Velas would have lost 95% of their investment. A Red Bull or McLaren fan investing in Tezos would be down 85%. An Alpha Tauri fan investing in Phantom would be down 95%. And an Alfa Romeo fan investing in Floki, a coin named after Elon Musk's dog, which personally tells you everything you need to know, would be down 91%. Not great. But then again, businesses of all kinds lose values as well as gain it. Fair. But I would imagine Formula One teams would not be as keen to put the logo of a one-year-old company with five employees on the side of their car if it came from another industry, because you know the risk that it wouldn't last the season. There are a number of other significant criticisms of cryptocurrency, which I'm not gonna cover in this video because my research took long enough as it is. If you are interested, I would encourage you to go out and research the positives and negatives of cryptocurrencies for yourself. There's a lot of good out there, but you should be aware of the bad stuff as well. Please go and do that before you consider investing in them. I would like to briefly touch on one hot topic though, sustainability, as it's quite key to Formula One. And actually, it's not as bad as you might think. Now, famously, Bitcoin is pretty bad for the environment. Like actually, really hilariously, incredibly bad for the environment. This is because Bitcoin, like lots of other older cryptocurrencies, operate on a proof of work model, which without going too technical, basically means every time you want to do something with cryptocurrency, hundreds of thousands of computers all around the world all have to validate it every single time you do something. 
That uses quite a lot of electricity. Thankfully though, newer cryptocurrencies are generally now using a proof of stake model, which doesn't require every single computer in the Western Hemisphere to boot up every time you want to buy a pizza. Ethereum, the world's second largest cryptocurrency and largest using a proof of stake model, managed to cut its annual emissions down from an eye-watering 11 million tons CO2 equivalent, more than some countries, down to 870. That's not 870,000, that's just 870. And actually, this system doesn't increase of scale. It's basically that much every year now. This is good, amazing news. This means that actually lots of cryptocurrencies are now more energy efficient than lots of traditional systems like say, Visa. That's great. Hardcore crypto and Bitcoin fans though will say that the more energy efficient proof of stake model is worse because it requires some centralization. Ugh, centralization. But I argue what's worse, that or emitting 50 million tons CO2 equivalent per year. This year, this year, that's more than Sweden. All of Sweden, all activities that happen within the confines of Sweden, it's more than that. Oh, but I hear you say, it's only 0.1% of global emissions. That's still too high. If I committed 0.1% of all the murders in my country, that's too many murders. That's far too many. It should be 0.0000. You get the picture. It's too high. All the other industries emit way more. They're bad too. You're all bad. So yeah, Bitcoin, not great for that reason. But as long as no one is promoting that specifically, I don't mind as much. Huh. I wonder what this brand name is implying. The final stop on our tour are cryptocurrency exchanges, the places where you will need to go if you want to buy and sell any of these coins. Red Bull is sponsored by Bybit, Alpine by Binance, McLaren by OKX, Alfa Romeo by Vold, Aston Martin and F1 itself by Crypto.com, and then Merck by FTX. Well, up until a couple of weeks ago, at least. Now, I'm obviously not the first person to talk about this, but it does need to be mentioned in this video. Mercedes' former sponsor, FTX, has filed for bankruptcy after they had a significant bank run, which is when a large number of people tried to withdraw their money and can't. It turns out FTX couldn't give these people their money because they didn't have it. They didn't have any cash or other liquid assets with which to pay them. It was backing up people's deposits with reserves of its own token, FTT, which might have worked um, until that token crashed. And actually, the reason the bank run started is because the token crashed. Huh, that's not, that's not a good system. What set all this off? Well, there were a couple of reports by Bloomberg and Coindesk about some slightly shady, very shady business practices between FTX and sister company Alameda Research, where they were just stealing money, basically. But the thing that kicked the crash off proper was one tweet. One tweet by rival exchange CEO Changpeng Zhou, or CZ for short. For those wondering, CZ is the CEO of Binance, proud sponsors of Alpine F1. Now, obviously, if FTX was being shady in its business practices, that's bad. But arguably, what's worse is a system which can be brought down by one tweet. One tweet which wiped out up to eight billion dollars of customer deposits. Eight billion. To clarify, I'm not blaming Binance or CZ. I am blaming FTX, but I'm just saying this is insane. This is insane. You know what might stop this? Financial regulation. Just saying. It turns out the financial regulation is actually not to hurt the little guy who's just trying to save for his retirement. It turns out actually it's there to specifically protect that little guy from some billionaire just stealing his savings. Who would have known? Regulation is a dirty word in the crypto world, but lack of regulations only benefits one type of person. It benefits someone who is willing to do all of the shady, very unethical stuff that regulations are put in place to make illegal. Good, well-written regulations don't typically hurt average people. They just hurt scumbags. 
With F1 making sustainability and safety two of its core ethics, we as fans have to question the brands that the sport and the teams surround themselves with. Now, Mercedes probably didn't know the depth of the wrongdoing by FTX. They knew they were shady because loads of people tried to warn them at the start of this season when the sponsorship was announced. Like, loads of people on Twitter and other places were sending them messages and... But I, I will concede they probably didn't know the depth, because no one did, of all this illegal stuff. Fair enough. But I would argue that those wrongdoings are indicative of the wider crypto industry as a whole. An industry which F1 and all its teams have embraced with open, largely unquestioning arms. Which brings me nicely to the final section of this video. The Mr. V's Garage Crypto Money Leaderboard, brought to you by Slave Labor. I guess that seems about on par. How much have each of the teams and the sport made from their partnerships in the crypto industry? Obviously, the details of these deals are private, but some do get reported on, which then helps us to make educated guesses about the rest of them, along with other sponsorships and well-known partnerships, blah, 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 blah. Let's go. Formula One's five-year deal with Crypto.com to bring you the Miami Grand Prix, sprint races, and tech talk YouTube videos, I think. $100 million over five years, $20 million a year. Red Bull's principal sponsor, Bybit, pays them $150 million over three years. That's $50 million a year. They are also sponsored by Tezos, and given the placement on the car, I would predict this to be in the region of $5 million per year. Considering Ferrari give Velas equal billing with Santander and Shell, who give a reported $50 and $10 million per year to the team, we can predict that Velas is paying at least $5 million per year on the low end. We are judging that also based on visibility on the car again because it's not quite as big as the big fucking Shell logo. <laughs> Mercedes FTX partnership was in the region of five to eight million dollars per year. Hard to know if that's actually been paid or not. Hard. <laughs> McLaren's sponsorship with OKX is interesting considering on their website they give them top billing over a better tomorrow, better known as British American Tobacco, who last year paid the team $30 million for side pod real estate and also special livery. I would imagine that BAT has rolled back their sponsorship, which is why they are now second build, but I would predict that the OKX sponsorship is worth at least $15 million per year. 15 million plus. They did also get a special livery and that's only for the big spenders. McLaren also has Tezos 2, which based on real estate on the car, we predict is another five million dollars per year. Alpine's sponsorship with Binance seems to be smaller, probably in the 500,000 to 1 million range, given they only have a tiny teeny little logo down here. Look at this. Alfa Romeo win the prize for most sponsor deals with four. It seems Floki is the biggest sponsor here, likely in the two to five million dollar range. And then Socios is likely around a million dollars, with Vold and Everdome being in the probably two to five hundred thousand range. I didn't actually mention these two, did I? Well, Vold is a crypto savings app, so similar to an exchange, but you can do less on it. And then Everdome is a <sighs> NFT metaverse. Aston Martin sponsor Crypto.com gets prime engine cover real estate for in the region of $5 million. And we can then also see that their NFT collection has sold for a total volume of $3.4 million. Some of that will have been secondhand selling, which Aston Martin still gets 10% from, but most of the 3.4 million will have been first-hand sales because, as we can see, no one wants to buy them anymore. Aston Martin also have Socios, which is likely in the 1 million range again, similar to Alfa Romeo. Hass's deal with OpenSea is brand new, so we actually don't know much about it. Considering on their website they're given pretty low billing, I would assume this is in the range of 500,000. But more will become clear soon, I'm sure. Phantom is one of AlphaTauri's top sponsors. Considering they don't actually ever have a main sideboard sponsor, but also given the relative size of the team, I would assume this is about $2 million. And then we have Williams with Virtua. As with most things surrounding Williams finances since being bought up by Doriton, a company that nobody knows the CEO of, we don't know anything about this. It's a back of the grid team and also only a minor sponsorship, so I would assume it's probably in the two to $500,000 range. 
Not a small amount of money, still, obviously, but in the grand scheme of this list, minor. And there we have it, Red Bull topping the tables again this season. The MK boys just cannot be stopped. In total, an estimated $125 million of crypto money flowing into the Formula One paddock this season. And it doesn't look like it's going to get any smaller next season. Now, Formula One is an expensive sport. The teams do need a lot of cash to pay engineers to design their parts, or for carbon fiber manufacturing, or for world-class catering. But the sheer amount of cash coming from the crypto industry may start to give it quite a bit of influence. And I just want to make sure that that influence is not being used to drive the average viewer towards something that is risky or potentially dangerous. If you enjoyed this video, please consider going ahead and giving it a like down below. This one took me a while. I had to rewrite the script several times, not only because I started writing it before all the FTX stuff happened, and then, well, all the FTX stuff happened, and so I had to do it again. <laughs> and then also I got food poisoning, uh, which is unrelated to crypto, but it still sucks, and that's why this is now a week later. The support from all of you watching is incredible, and the growth on this channel through this last season has been wild. If you aren't subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. We're getting so close to a million subscribers, only 994,000 away. If you think I missed any important details about cryptocurrency or the industry in this video, please let me know down below. I am also not trying to offend or ridicule anyone involved in the industry as a whole. Unless you're one of the people who tries to prove that Bitcoin is not bad for the environment, it is bad for the environment, stop writing these articles, you're an idiot. Rather, I'm just trying to shed some light onto the industry to help people who are discovering it for the first time learn about both sides of it. Stay safe out there, guys. I have been Mr. V, and until next time, I will see you guys later.